you enjoyed the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site, which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal, which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentinterview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. And obviously, obviously it's a high performance job. It's not, I suppose, like a normal job in quotes where, you know, you finish at five. Can you switch off once you've out, you know, off the base and at home or is it still, your mind still ticking? Well, it's a young man and women's game for a reason. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a, especially if you fly more than once, but I can tell you, you're beat. Um, not only are you, if you're a flight leader, you know, if you really think about when the adrenaline starts to increase in your body, it's the first day you see your name on the schedule, which is usually the day prior that you're leading a four VX and your briefings the next morning, very early in the morning. So mm -hmm. all night long, you're already starting to think about your tactics. You're starting to think about who is in the flight with you. Maybe it's a, a weapon school person. So, you know, or maybe you're getting worked up to go to weapon school yourself. So you want to really make a big impression. So all those thoughts start, creaming into your head so you don't get a great night's sleep you wake up extremely early you get to the squadron maybe two hours before the briefing starts to get your boards right because right. the briefing mm -hmm. rolls out on these boards now it's probably done on powerpoint which it is for sure I, i've done some on powerpoint but in my day it was all still the whiteboards and uh um, that's where you really yourself really start you know iterating and, and, and changing the small little things you get on the phone call with the adversaries, you get the weather, all this stuff starts coming together and you put together in your mind what your hope is uh, as close to a perfect briefing as possible. Then everybody files in and it's ready to go. There's a big adrenaline spike there. You're in front of your peers, yeah. you know, yeah. fighter pilots say I'd rather die than look bad in front of my peers, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so you want to do a great job briefing so adrenaline levels high, briefing's over, you go to the, the PE room, you start putting on your flight gear, you start stepping out to the jet as you get closer to the jet, adrenaline gets higher and higher, you go up the ladder, you pull the GFS handle, canopy comes down, now you're unbelievably focused, you're just absolutely switched on, take off, hit the tanker, whatever you're gonna do, go up there, do your mission, and if you're a flight leader or an IP, not only do you have to execute the mission like you briefed, but then you gotta remember everything. Every radio call, every missile that was shot, every little thing that you did, and what your three wingmen did, so in the debrief, you can reconstruct it and your ability to remember all those maneuvers and deconstruct it without having to look at a lot of tape differentiates you from being an average fighter pilot to a great fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. So even more adrenaline, you know, so I got to put my boards up. I got to reconstruct everything. And then you debrief in front of your peers. And remember, it's nameless and rankless. So even though you're the flight lead, even though you might have the most experience in the room, people are going to, you know, we're going to flay each other to get down to the root cause. That's the purpose of the debrief. So it gets real honest in there. And then uh, when the debrief's over, you can finally relax, you know, go to the, go to the bar, have a beer and then go home and do it all over again. So, uh, yeah, I, I think the adrenaline starts way before you get to the jet. It starts the night prior when you see your name on the schedule. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think we all get addicted to that and that's why it's so hard to leave. And that's why guys miss it so much. They certainly miss the camaraderie and the people, but you know, that being on step and absolutely being your unequivocal best and being pushed by some really good people, your peers. I don't really think we see that anywhere else in our lives. And that's why I think a lot of people struggle that, that, you know, we're elite military members, you know, that, that, that that's a tough thing to try to recreate in the real world. Absolutely. And before we get on to talk about uh, your books and obviously, of course, Afterburner, can you maybe share one or two stories with our viewers from your time on the Eagle that you think stands out? I've had a bunch. I mean, just so many. But, you know, I mentioned an ejection. I was involved in um, uh, an air to air um, uh, mishap. ACM mission where um, I was a uh, MiG-29. I was in the bandit role, third engagement of the day, low speed, 240 knots. I had uh, a guy that we were upgrading 
um, that we were trying to get him into a shooting position and he was getting close to a gun's position on me. Uh, we had his instructor who was re-entering the fight and lost sight. Uh, there were a few calm issues in there and they ended up running into each other right behind me. And it was, uh, the guy, the guy that was right behind me was right on the bubble about 500 feet, you know, 800 feet behind me. So I got a bird's eye view of what it looked like for two Eagles to smash into each other. Uh, when I rolled out of the turn, my, uh, the guy that was right behind me was literally in root formation to my right and the nose was smashed. I saw wires and stuff from the radar, gray dome. Uh, looked like an F-100 blunt nose F-15. And then when I got on the radio and, you know, said eject, 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 bail out, uh, you know, he had already made that decision. He didn't need my radio call. I saw the orange fireball kind of engulf inside the canopy and I saw the canopy pop up, do a field goal between the tails. I saw him come up, get the low speed drogue, see his arms and legs flailing, see the parachute rolled inverted over him, marked the position, which we're trained to do. Remember I said, we brief it every single mm -hmm. time. And then the, the guy that hit him, the instructor was really going fast when he re-entered into the fight. So I saw him pieces of parts flying off of his airplane. I saw him in a kind of a PIO, a pilot induced oscillation. It wasn't the pilot doing that it was the jet because it was losing mm -hmm. lots of flight controls. I was able to rejoin onto him and believe it or not, everybody's seen this eagle that, that landed the Israeli eagle, but this eagle was almost in that bad of shape. You know, big giant hole out of the left wing, all kinds of hydraulic fluid spewing out of it. When I say a big hole, a giant hole, M not much of the wing was left. Uh, but the leading edge was there, which was different than the Israeli one. Um, the right vertical tail was broken off at the base. I think it was right. And I think it was the left uh, horizontal stab was gone and he was flying the airplane. Wow. Long story, but, you know, I was his wingman and we, we went up to uh, McGee Tyson, Knoxville. That was our uh, divert field. That was, we were flying in the Snowbird Moa, which is about 109 miles northeast of Dobbins Air Force Base. And, uh, and this guy just did a phenomenal job. He was a patch wear, uh, just a great Eagle driver. And uh, he got the airplane on the ground. Anytime he get the, we did a, a controllability check, couldn't get the Eagle any slower than about 165, 170 knots, I think. It might've been as fast as 180 knots. We typically flew final at about 150, 155 ish. And he landed, uh, worked sure, how much hydraulic fluid was left we were amazed the gear came down and he got it stopped on the runway uh it was a squirrely uh rollout as well had a hard time keeping it uh on the on the concrete on the pavement and then i did an emergency climb and uh, uh and then recovered um so that made a big impression <laughs> and i saw the eagle that uh that uh barry ejected out of i i watched it hit the mountain the smoky mountains and watched a big orange fireball and watched an eagle impact the ground which was a was a was a very impressionable sight as you can imagine yeah i'd say I had, that's just great some great fights some great bfm engagements uh you know deploying to panama doing the drug running thing was interesting only because we didn't have a lot of roe then you know we were very early on in those drug running days so uh so I, I, some of the stuff we did was fairly amazing at the time. When I look back at look back at those days, you know, scrambling in the middle of the night uh, on some drug runner without his lights on and doesn't really have a uh, much of a care in the world of what he's doing and what he might be doing to us. Of course, he didn't know we were there. But a lot of stories on, on those days. And then um, uh, great flying. We went to Turkey. Um, you know, we trained the Singaporeans on some air combat early on in Singapore Sling. I think. You know, before that really became uh, an ongoing operation, we were there fairly early because I think there was a, a little bit of a strategic gap down uh, in that part of the world at the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was neat to go down there and fly against their F-5s and A-4s at the time and kind of teach them the debrief. That was one of the issues that their culture had. It was very difficult right. for um, them to open up and really. So I remember going through those debriefs and thinking they were very unusual and very different than ours. So. You know, I, I think we kind of helped that early culture in, in the Singaporean Air Force. And now they're flying F-15s, as you know. But um, gosh, there's just so many great stories of the air show stories, uh, you know, flying with my best friends uh, that are still my best friends today. Just uh, just been a, it was a great career. It, it was it was awesome. Um, and it lasted just about the right amount of time. So it was all good. And uh, 
you know, it served me well now in Afterburn, and things that I'm doing in the corporate world. And now I own a private equity firm, you know, called Afterburner Capital. And now we're starting to invest and use investors uh, uh, capital to, to, to grow great businesses. So, uh, um, you know, it's been it's been a great ride. Absolutely. And I bet you could like pinch yourself. You're like, I'm getting paid to do this job with my mates, my friends. You're like, That's an, yeah. absolutely incredible. Crazy. Well, I remember the first time I lowered myself down to the cockpit of the F-15 by myself. You know, there's only one seat in the in the F-15A. We mm-hmm. did have a B model uh, that I flew every now and then. But, you know, it, it is amazing. And when you think about how young we are when we're doing that and the responsibility we had, it's phenomenal. Um, and uh, without a doubt, the best job on the planet, I think, other than maybe rock star, professional athlete. But I don't know. Um, I, 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 I would right. say it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely but Murph how many hours did you get on the Eagle I got over a thousand hours in the Eagle I, I don't know the exact number I'd say it's probably right around 1100 maybe 1200 um, and uh, I think maybe close to 1200 um, and then I flew a bunch of other airplanes we didn't talk about but you know I got very interested in aviation after I became a fighter pilot and you know general aviation so had airplanes, flown a lot of different airplanes, maybe some of the most unusual ones. Uh, got a chance to fly in a P-51, the, of a T-51 backseat, which was really cool. Um, a nice one, yeah. And, yeah. Got to fly over my family farm, uh, which was really cool. And um, I was amazed at how loud that airplane is and how physical you have to be to actually get it to turn. Um, but yeah, uh, I flew the Icon A-5, a, a buddy of mine, designed and developed that airplane and launched it and uh, that was a cool little airplane to fly um nice. flown some you know amphibs and and um um flown the eclipse uh little, little jet you know uh a few times it you know that was a fun little airplane to fly as well so yeah flown flown a lot of general aviation airplanes as well flew for a short amount of time for united so i flew the 767 and i started out as a flight engineer on the 727 but uh you know, I, I, you know, I was an airline pilot for a short amount of time, really knew that my calling was being a CEO and, you know, my head was really in the corporate world at that time. So, uh, so I walked away from that career. Um, but, uh, it was flying, it was kind of fun flying that big, big piece of iron, but I, I knew that wasn't my long-term future. Yeah, where did the idea for Afterburner come from and when did it actually start? And was it difficult just trying to come up with like a new idea and get into to where it is now? Yeah, it was a, it was an unbelievably new idea at the time because there weren't really military speakers, trainers, team building. There were, certainly weren't uh, any real fighter pilot speakers at the time speaking about corporate performance based on what they learned as a fighter pilot. And we actually turned our methodology into a proprietary model called flawless execution, which is now a business model. But I got the idea just really that day. I told you I lowered myself down in the F-15 for the first time because I said, how does a farm boy from Kentucky like me get in this seat? And 16 months ago, I was packing my bags to go to officer school, uh, AMS, Mm -hmm. officer training school. And 16 months later, I'm flying an F-15. I mean, how do they get a guy like me to do this? And I realized that I went through a series of frameworks that were scalable and repeatable. And those powerful frameworks, the Air Force, Navy, and Marines couldn't even articulate themselves. And it took 50 years for them to get these things right. And I realized there are powerful frameworks for you and I, especially in the corporate world. So um, really that night, the day I soloed the F-15, I scratched out the basic tenets of flawless execution. And I wrote on a bar napkin, I'm going to start a company called Afterburner Seminars, and I'm going to teach this plan brief, execute debrief methodology as an agile framework to getting work done. And during the next seven years, while I was in the Georgia Guard, I started to kind of work on the idea, uh, met some business people, presented to YPO, Young Presidents Organization, and started just kind of refining and articulating it. And then finally, in 1996, decided to go give it a shot. My first client was uh, Home Depot, and uh, they ended up becoming the most admired retailer on the planet a year later, and we worked with them all that year. So we got a chance to be on every talk show, every newspaper, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Financial Times, um, and just had this incredible run because 
what made Afterburner great is I was hiring all of my friends that were fighter pilots. And, you know, we wore flight suits and we talked about what we did in our fighter cockpits, but related it back to this common model. And uh, it just blew up. And over the years, had a chance to write, you know, seven books on organizational execution, bringing in these cockpit methodologies into a business framework. And, you know, by doing that, I had a chance to get a front row seat with people like, uh, Andrew Newey, the, the CEO of PepsiCo, Brian Cornell, the CEO now of Target, uh, Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of Intel, you know, just some really top CEOs, but NFL teams too. You know, we helped two oh, wow. NFL teams go to the Super Bowl, one win the Super Bowl. Tom Coughlin called us up uh, before the 2012 win of the New York Giants, and we taught that team how to debrief. Um, and wow. they credit it wow. to their turnaround of the season. Matter of fact, Sports Illustrated mentioned us in an article. Uh, and then, you know, I worked with uh, uh, Peyton Manning, Eli's older brother, the next year with the Broncos, and we ended up training 14 NFL teams after that run. So it's just been great, been so cool, met some just phenomenal people. But, you know, the most important thing is that, you know, it, it just gives credit, you know, to all the air crew that you've interviewed. And, you know, it, it, we're all so passionate about what we did and the Afterburner platform enabled the world to see what we did and why we executed at eye level and they were able to use that simple framework to get better themselves so you know i feel like we were serving the fighter pilot community in a great way and helping uh, a lot of people learn some powerful tools yeah because it's really interesting because i'll just give a, a bit of background there my dad was a ceo of a big microchip company in singapore and uh, coaching in malaysia so i'm interested in high performance as well so when you go to these companies, are they all, uh, does, does everyone want to be there and listen to you? Or is it just like the big boss says, right, you're going to have to sit down, listen to us. This is how we're going to work. How does that work on like a bit of a nitty gritty kind of scale, a smaller scale? I mean, most of our work is the latter. Most of our work, we get hired by a company. It's their annual meeting. The CEO's coming in going, this is what we did last year. Here are our plans for ne next year. And we're the, either the keynote speaker or we're the team building event. Right. But what happens during that time is they go, holy moly, we don't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. And if we did that, that would be a game changer, which enables us to come in later for consulting and, and more training work. But I think we make a huge impression on them. You know, more, more so, you know, you can have a mountain climber, an athlete, a race car driver, and they talk a lot about their individual experiences. We talk very little about those fighter pilot experiences, but more about the actual frameworks that it's going to take for you to adopt these briefing and debriefing methodologies and these other things that we talked about, how to identify and eliminate task saturation, building situational awareness, how to create you know, a culture of wingman mutual support. And there's so many things that we teach these companies that most of your listeners, if they're air crew members, we take for granted uh, that aren't done and maybe your everyday life or certainly in, 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 in corporations that are struggling as an enterprise to align and execute in a complex, rapidly changing battle space, market space. So these combat methodologies work well uh, because if you really look at what's happening, especially right this second, the amount of change and complexity in the marketplaces, whether you're talking about IT, technology, oil and gas, you know, any type of energy, uh, retail, big box, um, you know, gig economy, everything's being disrupted almost on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. having a simple framework that's agile, that stays at the same rate of change or slightly ahead of it really puts you at the top of the heap. Absolutely. And how many team members do you have and where can we find Afterburner online? Well, you can find Afterburner online at afterburner.com. Uh, I've got a website as well, jamesdmurphy.com, uh, or LinkedIn, and I would love to link in with any of your members because we put out a lot of content there. My LinkedIn handle is Flawless Execution or James D. Murphy on LinkedIn. Um, Afterburner, over the years, we've been as large as 80 team members around the globe and, uh, you know, probably as small as... Uh, 30 team members and we kind of fluctuate in, in our current configuration between probably 30 and 50. And a lot of the folks that are on our team, you know, are flying their jets, either in the guard reserves. We, we, have, we even have a few active duty people or in the airlines. So this is a part-time gig for them. So 
the team changes quite often and the size of the team uh, ebbs and flows because most of the workforce is 1099. They're not full time. Uh, so they do this as a side gig. This is kind of like another guard or reserve job for them. Yeah, absolutely. And all the links will be in the description. But uh, Murph, to wrap up, I've got some personal questions here, if you're happy to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Do you have any hobbies? Oh, yeah. I'm very, very passionate about two hobbies, and that's fishing and hunting. Nice. Okay. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm talking to you from Miami. I live in Miami on the water. So uh, uh, I love fly fishing in the flats for bonefish, permit, and tarpon, and snook. And then I love offshore fishing for marlin, sailfish. We do both of those things on a regular basis. And then I love traveling around the world chasing blue marlin as well. Um, and then we have a farm up in Kentucky. I've got two young boys, 12 and 10. So we're up there chasing whitetails, turkeys, black bears. And uh, I also love to elk hunt. And I'm a big bow hunter. So most of the hunting I do is with a bow, bow and arrow. And I um, was lucky enough to kill a pretty big elk out in Colorado a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, so that's what I love to do. And I still love to work out and uh, stay in shape and fly a little bit. So uh, those are my main hobbies. Favorite aircraft you have flown? Oh, I mean, there's just no doubt. I mean, it's it's the mighty eagle. I mean, nothing even comes close. I can't imagine anything coming close unless, you know, I had an opportunity to fly the F-22, which will never happen. But uh, I love that bird a lot. Um, so, yeah, without a doubt, the F-15. Brilliant stuff. One you wish you could fly either past or present. Oh, the F-22. I'd love to fly the Raptor. Yeah, Raptor would be right up there. Um, I think flying a Spitfire would be really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I think an F4U Corsair would be really cool. Um, but, you know, without a doubt, the F-22 would love to fly the F-22. Yeah, it's a nice change because normally they're the Mustangs or the Spitfire. So it's nice to see uh, like a, a bit of a modern jet. So that's perfect. But uh, Murph, thank you very much for coming on the show and sharing a bit your story. And as I say, everything will be linked in the description. So go and give uh, them guys a like. But uh, yeah, Murph, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. And happy hunting to all your listeners. Cheers.